Okay, welcome. Welcome. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Um, my name is Mads Torgersen, uh, known in America as Mads Torgersen. And um, I work on C Sharp for Microsoft. I always, I'm getting old, so I always carry a t-shirt with the name of the programming language I'm working on, in case I forget. Um, and um, I'm here to talk about C Sharp and uh, why it may be uh, maybe worth thinking about, uh, even if you haven't so far. So uh, let's get the uh, let's get the embarrassing details over with. Uh, uh, how many people are already familiar with C Sharp? <laughs> That's a lot. How many are not? Wow. So uh, I will I will completely fail introducing somebody to uh, to C Sharp at this talk. It's good to know. <clears throat> we can maybe <clears throat> breeze over some details I had planned on and uh, get into some I hadn't. So. Um, even um, even so, they say that the reason why they um, they make those SUV commercials uh, is not to make people buy them; it's to make the people who already bought them feel good uh, about the fact that they did. So uh, maybe I can uh, maybe I can achieve that. So um, I am have been asked to remind you to uh, evaluate the talk. Um, it's good for me because uh, then if I do something uh, uh, in a in an unsatisfactory way, I can do it better next time, maybe. Um, and it's good for the go-to folks because then they can decide whether to invite me again some other time. So um, uh, I do want to. So this is in the feel-good department. Um, Stack Overflow have a survey every year of, of the, their developers, and they um, they ask them various questions. And and of course, it's skewed and and unscientific in all kinds of ways. First of all, you have to be in Stack Overflow to participate. But uh, I, the, I like the numbers, so I'm going to use them anyway. Um, so um, if we look here, uh, C Sharp is, is a very widely used language. Um, it's number four here. Of the three above, uh, one of them is not a programming language. So um, and I'm, I'm not talking about JavaScript. I'm talking about SQL. And so, uh, so C Sharp is definitely a language that's in broad usage already. It's, it's one of the sort of main mainstream languages, if you will. Um, and uh, they also ask people uh, whether they would like to continue using the language they're using, uh, and they, rate, uh, they use that to rate the most loved technologies. And it's interesting to see that C Sharp is on this list as well. right? So people actually love C Sharp to some degree. There's some languages that they love more, but if you notice, many of them are, are languages with smaller audiences, sort of very dedicated audiences that are um, um, maybe more part of a cult or something. And, um, and, uh, but it's, it, there's only a few here at the bottom that are actually on both lists that are both um, highly used and highly loved. So it's nice to be one of the three technologies on that list, two of which are programming languages. And yay for Python also for being on there. Right? So, so, so we in Python, we must be doing something right. And, um, and we, we constantly try to think about what is it that we're probably doing right uh, that, we are, that we are still a fairly enjoyed programming language after all these years. Um, so it seems to be not the fact that everybody uses C Sharp just because they have to, because uh, people did it 10 years ago at their company, and they have all this legacy code. There seems to be some kind of energy around, and we, we want to try to keep that going. And we have some ideas about why that may be, and, and that's sort of what is driving our, our language evolution, if you will. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, but I think one core thing to, to point out here is that um, we are very eager to evolve C-sharp. Like, if you look at the language evolution scale from a little to a lot, we, we're kind of over there. As, a mainstream as mainstream languages goes, we kind of tend to be pretty aggressive about keeping the language fresh and keeping it modern. And as the programming language um, uh, state of the art evolves, so do we. And sometimes we are the, we're the movers, and sometimes we're the followers. But we try to keep the language um, a good choice for programmers in modern day, not just something you have to do because somebody made that choice um, in, a, in a previous decade. So that's kind of our philosophy around it. Um, I also want to point out F-sharp because it's our, our little sister language, and it's, it's very popular because it's also very small. Um, and, um, and there's a talk next door 
about it at the same time. So I'm, I'm sorry that, um, that, that those are scheduled at the same time. But um, F sharp is, is a very much more functional language, and we have a lot of, we have a lot of um, benefit from, uh, from uh, the collaboration with F sharp and the kind of inspiration that it gives us in the, in the C sharp language design as well. So I wanted to call that out. Um, so uh, how many of you use C sharp on something other than Windows? OK, thank you. It looked like none for a second there. Now it's more like 2%. Good. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, so most people use C Sharp on Windows. Um, and that's because that pretty much used to be where you could use C Sharp. Um, and, um, and we kind of were changing our tune on that. So part of the reason I wanted to, to frame the talk in this way was that um, we're really pushing. It's, it's sort of increasingly been the case that you can use C Sharp elsewhere. We're really pushing to make that an option, right? We're sort of in this weird situation where um, C Sharp has been a massive main programming language on Windows, but at the same time, we're like complete newcomers to uh, some other platforms, um, or at least uh, mostly so. And so there's this interesting situation where now that it's actually becoming an option on all the platforms, um, we're at the same time very entrenched and, and, and also very, uh, very new and kind of a fledgling uh, language on some of those platforms. And we're eager to um, to help uh, that adoption on, on those other platforms. Um, one other thing that has changed, um, that is changing how and where you can use C Sharp, is the fact that we've um, evolved our language technology. So the, the compiler and ID technology that underlies the implementation of the language quite a bit with what we call Project uh, Roslyn. And that's enabling um, some, uh, some, I think, quite unique scenarios um, about how you can use uh, and how you, can, um, how you can program in C-sharp. I'm, I'm going to show a little bit of that, because I think it's, uh, it's nerdy and cool, and maybe you can, uh, you, it's also useful to you. Um, one of the consequences of that is that um, that work on sort of the language core and ripping it out of the sort of Windows and Visual Studio specifics means that it's become, um, it's become very easy, well, as these things go, to, to um, implement C Sharp in other IDEs. So you can essentially use C Sharp in your favorite IDE, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well, or your favorite editor. Um, and of course, uh, um, one of the big changes is that we moved from being a completely proprietary technology to being completely open source. So everyone can contribute to C Sharp, and a lot of people do. And um, we, we're getting a, a conversation with the community that's vastly different now. It's more of a co collaboration project as opposed to Microsoft says. And, uh, and that's very exciting. It means that rather than coming out every three years or whatever and saying, ta-da, this is what we worked on, hope you like it, we are now in a very open uh, dialogue every day with, with the community about uh, our direction. We get feedback all the time. Um, like probably tens of you will come to me after and, and say why we should be doing something different or, or proposing things. Um, and that happens online and on GitHub and, um, and um, Elsewhere as well, so we have a much better uh, we, we have much better quality on our design work as a result of it. I think. Okay, um, so that's a couple of good things. Let's start about let's start with some of those um, other places that C Sharp are. So, how many people here um, have used uh, Xamarin? So a few there. Um, so have you all? You must all have used Xamarin to non Windows on non Windows platforms, right? Some, that, that, that's, probably the, uh, the, that's probably the reason why you do. So Xamarin, how many people are aware what Xamarin is? Okay, about half. Xamarin is, um, Xamarin, it used to be a separate company. Uh, we acquired them uh, uh, six months ago. It's a technology for um, using C Sharp to target, uh, to make native apps for Android and iOS. Right? So it's technology that very much, that's very much based on letting you use the same language and the same source code, for the most part, uh, to write, um, to write uh, apps for multiple different uh, mobile platforms. Right? So it, it works on iOS, it works on Android, it actually targets Mac as well, and uh, by the way, Windows too, if you want to, um, and uh, create, you know, creates high quality native UI. It's, it's in, um, there's a number of big apps that are using this technology because it saves the effort of separate implementations on those platforms. It also lets you use a language that you can use on the back end as well, which yes, you can with Java, but um, it's not quite there yet with, uh, with Swift or Objective-C. 
Um, and so it's sort of um, it's economy of scale, and it's also just a very good language for, for implementing apps. It's based on, on the Mono project. How many people know about the Mono project? Um, OK, about half. So which, that is um, an open source implementation done by people outside of Microsoft many years ago and maintained ever since to, to target C Sharp to um, other platforms and Windows. While we at Microsoft were sort of uh, tunnel vision on Windows for many, many years, these people saw the cross-platform potential of C Sharp much before we did and, um, and implemented this great cross-platform or uh, uh, cross-platform implementation. Um, so Xamarin is based on that, and um, and a lot of the apps that you see in the uh, the iOS or Android uh, stores are actually based on C Sharp, either because of Xamarin or uh, because of Unity, um, which is probably the industry leading uh, game engine. Uh, so if you're up there on the back rows playing a game instead of listening, uh, chances are it's written in Unity, right? So you're even even your hands are engaged in C Sharp right now. Um, so again, this is based on Mono, and um, and uh, these 2D, this 2D, 3D game engine is um, is one that you essentially target with C Sharp. Um, so a lot of those games out there are, are written in C Sharp as well. So we we do actually have this cross-platform reach um, in many of the client technologies um, that many people are not aware of. So I wanted to call that out. Also at Microsoft, um, we're working on what we call .NET Core, which is a fresh implementation, if you will, of, of the whole .NET stack, the runtime and the libraries, um, that's intended to be lightweight and for kind of server-side uh, server use for cloud and server workloads. Um, it's also cross-platform, works in Linux and Mac, um, oh, and Windows. <laughs> and um, and we're, we're putting the ASP.NET uh, framework on top, which is a very broadly used uh, web framework that you can now, you can now run on non-Windows machines. Um, and it's open source. Um, so um, this kind of helps with, uh, why are we building a separate one? Well, this helps with uh, sort of the more, the lighter weight things that you want to do when you're on the server side. Uh, first of all, there's no UI framework, um, but it also uh, is able to do um, standalone deployment, for instance. You can ship the runtime together with your code um, so that you don't have dependencies on various things being installed on the box that it happens to run on in the cloud somewhere. So it kind of has a better architecture, um, uh, makes it a lot more suitable for, for microservices and stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of trying to modernize our, uh, our platform for the, uh, for the server side as well. How many people have dabbled with the .NET Core so far? So quite a few again, wow. Uh, given that the tooling isn't even uh, RTM yet, I'm, I'm quite impressed. Um, do you like it? Okay, I'm glad to hear, because a lot of people don't yet. Um, but I think uh, we kind of just need to finish it properly. Um, so this kind of proliferation of all these different .NETs that run on different um, platforms or sets of platforms creates a little bit of confusion, um, especially if, you are, if you're like a library provider, you want to try to write something that runs on uh, multiple different platforms. So we're also, um, we're also doing what we call .NET Standard, which is a, a, we're specifying a set of APIs that are supposed to be on all compliant .NET platforms, that if you target that, and you can sort of just say target .NET Standard um, in your tool, then, uh, then you, you, the thing you write will run everywhere. And so you, can, so you, you kind of claw back the ability to, uh, to, um, to write um, code that, that works everywhere in, in the .NET ecosystem. And we'll evolve the standard uh, over time, including new kind of core essential libraries. And, um, and you can then target whichever, whichever standard you want. So um, that's pretty much the rub on where C Sharp runs. And hopefully that should convince, if there was anyone in the room who needed to be convinced, the uh, people that there's, um, that there's a much bigger addressable uh, space for, for C Sharp than, than there's sort of traditionally been. And it, it's, it's kind of a, exciting for us to, um, to be able to target that. So um, I, wanna, I wanna go uh, to the more uh, geekery side and talk more about the, uh, the project Roslyn. So I said that we modernized or the C Sharp language engine, if you will. Um, it used to be that there was a C Sharp compiler. It was written in C++. Um, and then there was Visual Studio and some language integration there for C-sharp, and both kind of understood C-sharp in their own way. 
There's a little bit of code sharing, and nobody else could kind of get in on the deal. If somebody wanted to understand anything about C Sharp, write a tool, or um, their own IDE support or whatever, they were kind of lost. They had to start from scratch because it was all black box. And um, and when we um, and, and that was kind of unsatisfactory for us as well. So when we decided it was time to rewrite the compiler, we not only did we do it in C Sharp, but we also took some strong uh, architectural stance, if you will, on how it should be done. So essentially, I don't think we articulated it quite this way when we started, but this is kind of how it turned out, um, that there should really only need to be one place in the world where the C-sharp semantics are implemented. Right? We should build the thing that everybody can use for everything they want to do with the language. Um, regardless of platform, regardless of what it is they're doing, regardless of whether it's a batch process or whether, like a compilation, or whether it's an interactive situation like an IDE full of, full of uh, erroneous code and, and all that stuff. It should, it should work for all of those things. So it's a pretty lofty goal, um, and it took us, it took us uh, quite a while. <laughs> and, a lot of, and a lot of people worked on it. But, but we now have the Roslyn API, which, is, which really does satisfy this goal. And, and most things out there that, um, that understand C-sharp are shifting over to, uh, to, or have shifted over to use Rosling. Not all of them. I don't know um, um, the previous speaker in the room, but uh, JetBrains is an, is an exception to this um, for, for te technical reasons of their own. But so the idea really is that this is the code base that you use to implement IDs and editors, and, and if you have analysis tools of various kinds, linter, linters that call out problems with your code, if you want to manipulate code, like have automatic fixers or refactorings or whatever that produce new code from old code, uh, you can use it. If you actually generate source, you can use it. If, you, if you're doing more interactive things like scripting or REPLs or whatever, like we have a, now a C Sharp REPL in, the, in Visual Studio, for instance, it's built on top of Roslyn. Oh, and, and it still does compile the code as well and, uh, and produce output. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is sort of a, um, a sampling of the kinds of things that you can do and that people are doing uh, in spades with Roslyn right now. So it has really created this... Um, uh, this explosion, this Cambrian explosion of, uh, of language-based tools because people can now get off the ground much faster. It sort of democratizes working with the language. Um, you already have something you can ask about the syntax and semantics. You just need to add the specific bits to what you want to do. And um, one particular a community project uh, that makes really great use of this is OmniSharp. How many people have heard of or used OmniSharp? Uh, so that's, that's too few. Uh, more of you should know about OmniSharp. It's really a project to make C Sharp available on your favorite editor. Okay? And the way they do it is pretty clever. Uh, because C Sharp now runs everywhere, <laughs> they, can take, uh, they can take the Roslyn C Sharp engine and they can run it in a separate process on whatever machine you're, uh, you're uh, developing on, be it a Mac or whatever. Uh, they run that uh, as a separate process, and then they only need to do a thin integration into the whatever integration layer that particular editor has that talks on the wire using some wire format, talks to the process about everything regarding the language. So every time you, you press a key, like you press dot and you want to get completion, um, it asks uh, the process uh, next door, like, hey, uh, they press dot. What should I show in the completion list? And it knows all the semantics, so it'll tell them, oh, these five methods are available. Show those. And, and um, it's kind of this separation of concerns where all the language understanding is wrapped up in a separate process and can be created over that standardized wire format. And so that makes it, made it possible to go and implement um, C, uh, really good semantically aware C-sharp modes in, uh, in lots of editors that m some of you might, uh, might love it or hate or whatever, um, some of which are sampled up here. I should note that uh, Microsoft's Visual Studio Code, for instance, uses OmniSharp for its C-sharp mode, which is an extension that you just load in like everything else. It's not, it's not built into the editor. C Sharp is just an extension like, uh, like other languages. So uh, that's a pretty cool technology, I think. Um, I also want to, it, it's time for some code, I think. And uh, I don't know if you're itching, itching for code as well, or it makes you sleepy. Um, we'll, it's probably 50 50. Oh, I should, um, I should uh, go out and, um, and see if I have my project still running here. So uh, let's do probably the weirdest geekiest uh, example here. We have some resolution issues here. This should be good. Can you see the code in the back row? Yes? 
You can actually read it? Cool. Well, it is a pretty big screen up there. Good. So um, what I want to do is some, one of the things we did to kind of uh, help people get started thinking about language-based tool and try to democratize it is we, we created this framework that we call the analyzer framework, where it's really easy to build something that analyzes people's source code and can give diagnostics on it. And also to build something that when you get those diagnostics, it will offer up fixes to the code. Um, and so if you think about your organization having special code styles that you want to enforce, or uh, you have um, refactorings that you want to build because you often do this kind of manipulation of the code yourself, and, or you want to share that with the world, you, you, were, uh, you have fixes that you often find yourself doing that, uh, that you might as well automate, this is, the, this is a tool for you. And what I'm, this is a, um, this is a project type that you can just install in Visual Studio and start using. When you open the project, um, it comes with a bunch of boilerplate already built for you. So um, what happens specifically when you enter debug mode on a project like this is that it takes that analyzer that you are writing and the code fixes and whatever, and it installs them. Like they, they can be run in batch code or whatever. You can ship them as a NuGet package, but what it does is it actually installs them as a Visual Studio extension in a nested version of Visual Studio that it then runs as part of the debug mode here. So now I have Visual Studio running Visual Studio with the code fixes that I'm writing uh, actually operative in the nested version of Visual Studio. So let's open some code in the nested version of Visual Studio here. And um, so I should say that I haven't actually completely written those analyzers yet. We'll do that together. So it doesn't do anything yet. But here's some sample code that we want to operate on. Um, the, um, the, the thing I want to implement um, is purely syntactical, just for simplicity. But you, I could have implemented very uh, semantic rules as well. The, the uh, Rosalind engine provides complete information for me to use. But what I want to just say here is it's bad style to have uh, statements inside of if statements or else clauses that don't have curlies around them. Like, we want to implement that old-fashioned, rigid style of there always have to be curlies, because then you don't get so many, so many bugs as you edit the code later. So we want to actually complain about this code in those cases. And, and for, uh, in the sake, for the sake of time, I'll only implement it for if, but we could also implement it for else. So let's implement a little code analyzer live here. Um, so we, we go back to the running code. I'm not actually going to going to stop the nested, uh, the nested thing here. I'm going to just put a breakpoint. So um, what I did is essentially, what I did ahead of time is I'm just re registering that whenever we see an if statement, we should call this method analyze node. That's all I did. And so whenever the, the source analysis in Visual Studio hits uh, an if statement, go here. OK? And um, let's then go and, and uh, trigger that. So if we go to the nested Visual Studio here, uh, and I do an edit, it will reanalyze the code. And boom, it'll hit the breakpoint. And I, am now, I now get all kinds of information about where I am in the code that I can start uh, working on. So the thing that I get past is, is, a, is a context object. So let's look what's inside of that. Uh, context dot. Hmm. Looks like I am able to report diagnostics if I don't like this if statement. I can also get the, the node of the syntax tree that I'm looking at, uh, which is the if statement, hopefully. So let's start getting that out. And um, if we hover over it here, since we're in de debug mode, that's an actual object that got passed in. We see that it is indeed an if statement. Sorry that the, the, t the font is a little small here. So let's, uh, let's get it as an if statement. Um, using just, essentially, Roslyn is an object model for code, right? So I'm just looking at a syntax tree node, and it happens to be a, the derived class that is a, an if statement syntax here. So we can say var if statement is that thing. And now that's the only kind of thing we're going to get called with, so I'm going to skip checking that it, was act, it actually was an if statement. And we'll just say, when is an if statement wrong? Well, it's wrong if the if statement's statement the thing that's inside of it, if that is not something with curlies around it. And that's called a block. So if, that, if the kind of thing that this is is not a block, syntax kind.block, then I want to complain. OK? Then I want to say to the user, you're, you're wrong. And so what I essentially want to do is to take that, remember that um, report diagnostic that I have here. Now I'm going to report a diagnostic. Okay. And what am I going to 
put in there, I'm going to put a diagnostic. Okay, whatever that is, let's call it diagnostic. Um, so I don't have that yet, so I'm going to use a, re a little refactoring to generate a local for it. Um, it turns out I can create a diagnostic by saying diagnostic.create, and it takes a few things. I happen to have prepared a descriptor, uh, sorry, um, it's called rule. And then I need some kind of location. That is where, that is where to put a squiggle in the code when this, uh, when this problem appears. And then I need to say what kind of statement, what kind of thing I'm looking at here as well. So, okay. Um, and we need to find out what the location is. So let's do that refactoring again, generate a local. This is all while I'm in debug mode, by the way. I'm, I'm actively debugging right now. Um, uh, let's see, what is the location? We're probably... The, the note that I'm looking at, the if statement, where, where do we actually want the squiggle? Let's have it on the if keyword, all right? So the if statement, what does it have? It has an if keyword, because this is a, this is a concrete syntax tree. It has all the details about the code, including where everything is. Um, and so let's um, get the location of that. Let's see, there's a get location method. Let's get the location of that if keyword and, um, and put that in. Okay, so I just wrote some code. Um, let's see if it actually works. Uh, let's remove the breakpoint and, and uh, keep running in the debugger. We wait a little to see what happens, and now you see squiggles appear in the if statements up here, right? So that was all I had to do was write those three, four lines of code in order to identify the problem and, and tell, the, tell the framework where to show it, okay? And, um, and just to prove to you that, that it actually works, I can... I can go, where did that sound come from? I can go and, um, and put curlies there and the squid will go away on that if, all right? So um, essentially we created a very easy to use, it gets a little harder when you start to do complex things, but a, a relatively easy uh, to use model of the language, including its full syntax and its full binding semantics and so on, so that people can build tools, share them out, and the whole editing experience for everyone using C Sharp, regardless of which editor they use, as long as it's based on Roslyn, regardless of um, which platform they, they're on, uh, they can, they can um, benefit from these. And the analyzer that I wrote can be equally run in batch mode. Like, it could be part of the compilation process, and it could flag warnings or errors just like the compiler does in its own native things. All right? So um, let's see for time. I'm probably going to skip. I could also implement the fixer, but I'm not going to do that in the interest of time. Uh, but we could also write a little fixer, it's not much harder, that actually fixes up the code and puts those curlies in. Okay, so that's sort of the geek out on the, um, on the uh, Roslyn side and, uh, and how that hopefully um, helps people uh, get a better ed editing experience, a better development experience with C Sharp, uh, quite outside the language. It also gives us, gave us a much better code base, a much better architected code base, and obviously one in C Sharp, so we can dogfoot our own language that helps us evolve the language itself. It's a lot easier f for us now and f to, to evolve the language and for the community to participate in that evolution uh, through contributions. So let's take, a, let's take a quick reminder of the evolution of C Sharp here. Um, that's a lot of versions. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, I think it kinda, what it kind of shows is that uh, this kind of aggressiveness that we've had in innovation, I kind of... Um, I may want to point out the, um, the async. Um, there's there's a, a couple of things that I, where I think we kind of uh, we kind of did fun things in the language. We did uh, the uh, the link the queries that we uh, introduced in in C sharp three um, really sort of took. It's one of the things that we try to do is we kind of try to take concepts that exist in interesting languages that aren't very used, and we try to mainstream them and kind of pull them into. C Sharp uh, as a mainstream language and, and help bring them to, bro to a broader market, if you will. And this is definitely an example of that. The link queries in C Sharp are an example of comprehensions that you find in functional languages and so on. We pulled those in along with lambdas. Now every, every language in the world has lambdas. It was a little less common back then. Java got them now, I hear. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. Of course, way back in C Sharp 2, we did generics, only a little later than Java did. Um, I actually got to be part of introducing generics to Java, then went to C-sharp and, and was, uh, was part of rolling it out there. Um, in C-sharp, we did it right. Um, in that, um, 
I'm sorry, I'm getting into Java bashing. I shouldn't really. Um, we did it right in that uh, generics are kind of deeply uh, implemented into the, uh, into the runtime. Like Java did the more cautious approach of making generics something that the compiler compiles away. But when you have it deeply in the runtime, that, that's really good for um, kind of, first of all, getting the semantics 100%, but it also means that the performance characteristics are, are very different, especially when you have value types in the language like C Sharp had from uh, version one. I hear that Java is possibly getting it sometime in the future. Uh, when you have value types, you really want generics to recognize those and, and kind of specialize for those value types so you don't get a lot of boxing and allocation uh, around using generics. It has to be that generics makes your code faster, not slower. And, um, and generics has really been the workhorse for many of the language features we did since then. We were able to do uh, queries right because of generics, because the generics was deeply implemented in the runtime, it were available through reflection, uh, as we did all kinds of weird code quoting and translating C Sharp to SQL and all that kind of stuff, it was all based on the fact that the types would flow and that would be available even at runtime. Uh, dynamic, which integrated um, dynamicness into a static type system by having a type for when things were dynamic, called dynamic, um, again uses uh, generics heavily under the hood to make that efficient um, and to avoid a bunch of uh, boxing and stuff. Async, very deeply uh, reliant on, um, on generics as well. Um, then uh, in C Sharp 6, we got Roslyn, and we were like, okay, now it's no, longer, uh, it's no longer a big war to implement any given language feature. We actually have more agility. And so now's the time to take all those little features that we never got to implement that we wanted to implement to just make development easier and nicer and lighter and cleaner. Uh, and so we did a swath of those in C Sharp 6, which is the version of C Sharp that's out there now. Um, and then in C Sharp 7, we're, we're taking on some of the some deeper features again that we think that we, we again borrow heavily from the functional world and we think that we are, um, we are essentially taking the next step in terms of dealing with data that's not necessarily so object oriented, if you will. Um, I think you're seeing us start as a very object-oriented language and kind of lean towards a more functional style as a supplement to the object-oriented, if you will, and trying to integrate those as well as we can. That's a bit of an inspiration from Scala, if you will, and what it's doing on the JVM, which is to try to make functional and object-oriented work well together, but definitely with, the, with our roots in the, in the imperative object-oriented world for, for, um, for our situation. And so I think the next thing we should do, I'm gonna skip the async demo, uh, since most of you probably know what that is about. Um, and then let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what is, uh, is coming into C Sharp 7. So how many people have, um, how many people here actually use C Sharp 6? Or newer? <laughs> so that's quite a lot of you. So many of you have a feeling for what's in there already. Um, so for C Sharp 7, and now I apologize to the few in the room that aren't C Sharp if, that gets, if this gets a little too, um, too deep here, but I think hopefully it's still useful to see. Um, I, I didn't plan to kind of show all the new features that are there, but I think some of the most important ones are, are worth uh, looking at. It, it kind of goes to um, some of the common situations you find you're in where the, the sort of standard C style object oriented paradigm get a little in the way. So let's start out with, um, let's start out with tuples. So I have, this is my whole program here. So um, I have some numbers. Actually, since they're, um, uh, you know, they're sort of recognizable here, but not everybody may know them by heart. We, we actually have binary literals now. It's, it's kind of a tiny feature, but, but hey, um, uh, it's, it's good for when you're teaching your kids to program, right? Uh, this is actually, these are the bits that are underneath these numbers. So, okay, I'm gonna stop here. No, actually, I'm, I'm gonna make one more because another thing we also, this is totally just in the, I'm, I'm just doing this because, uh, yeah, I don't know why I'm doing it. But we also have digit separators now so you can, like other languages do, so you can put underbars wherever you want so the numbers get easier to read, which, and, and if you want many, it's fine, you know, you can, so. Okay. Um, now we, let's leave the 32 there. So what I want to do is I want to implement a method called tally that, uh, that summarizes the numbers in an array and also that, that sums them up and also counts them, okay? So we'll tally these numbers, okay? 
Uh, of course, I don't have that method yet, so let's use a refactoring to generate it. There's a static method here. Um, it returns void. It probably should return something else. Um, but this is, so here's the question, right? Should it return the sum or should it return the count? Both, yes, right. Okay, so, um, so the idea is you can only return one thing in C Sharp today, but tomorrow you can return two things. Uh, and three, like Kotlin, but you can also return four. Um, so if you were in the room last week, Kotlin, we, we beat you by one. Actually, we beat you by infinity, because you can have as big tools as you want, but it's probably a, a bad idea. So, so let's return two ints, okay? Um, so this is a tuple type, um, and it's sort of deliberately, well, it's a tuple type, so it says two ints, so it should be pretty easy to, um, to understand. And here's a tuple literal that uh, we'll just return a dummy for now um, to get started. Um, that then consists of some values also with parentheses and, parentheses and commas. And that shouldn't be too surprising a syntax for it. Um, and so when I go up here, I can take the result of the tally and I can look at it and lo and behold, it's a tuple. Great. So how can I use a tuple? Let's, um, let's print something out. Since this is a console app, that's pretty much what we can do. Interpolated strings, we love them. The sum is probably the first thing in there. So let's see, t dot, let's see what a tuple has. Well, it has an item one and it has an item two. Okay, it's kind of obvious what they are, so we can use them. Not the best names in the world, but it works. t dot item two, okay. So here's something that works. Um, but it would, I mean, it would be nice if they had nicer names. So tuples in C-sharp um, can actually op, uh, optionally have names for the different, um, um, for the different elements here. So now I gave them names. And uh, what does that mean? Well, it means that when I get it back, uh, it tells me what they are. Good sort of uh, operat operational comment, if you will. It also means, though, that if I go here and, and press dot, in addition to these, which the, this is a preview, the final version should probably hide the, the bad names when we have the good names, because you can see sum is here and I can use that name instead. Um, so uh, the, these are the sort of real names of the underlying type, but the compiler knows to, uh, to keep track of these other names and show those instead, so you get a nicer experience uh, going against that. So um, I think it's important that tools have, have um, names in them because who can, uh, who can remember whether it was first name, last name, or last name, first name, and all those things, right? It, it needs, they need to come with, with that information, and it needs to be operational. You need to be able to get it. Of course, you might uh, prefer to immediately pick the tuple apart as you get it and deconstruct it, and you can do that too in C-sharp. So you can say sum come account here, and uh, now uh, the tuple immediately gets deconstructed into some variable and account variable that get declared here. Um, and instead of t dot here, we can just say sum and count. Okay. All right, tuple names, yay. Um, mm -hmm. so, um, so let's go now and implement this method for real. So instead of returning uh, just a dummy here, let's return a result. Um, and let's... Uh, Let's make the result equal to that dummy value here to start with. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to for each over the numbers, let's call them values because I like that better. Uh, let's for each over the values and var v in values. And then we want to update the result every time around. So we can say, actually result is too long. Um, I want to just call it r, is that okay? There we go. Um, so let's just say r equals, and then a new tuple literal, r dot, I want to get the old value out. I wish, I wish r had names as well. Let's go and give it names. Um, we can, you can give names in the tuple literal as well. So you do that with the same syntax that you use for uh, named arguments. Um, so now r has a, an s and a c. So now we can say r dot s, the sum that's already there, plus the new value and the count that was already there, plus one, okay? So um, you might 
you might be justified in wondering, isn't this terribly wasteful? Isn't he allocating a new array uh, or a new tuple every time around in this loop and in these, uh, these resource-constrained devices and, and, um, and cycles that cost money on the cloud and so on? Isn't it wasteful to allocate all these tuples? And it's not because the tuples aren't actually objects. They're, they're, uh, tuple is a, uh, tuples are implemented as a value type, as a struct in C Sharp. So they're not allocated. This is just really in place updating some stuff that's already on the stack. Right? So they're, they're value types that are passed by copy, not by reference. Tuples don't have identity. They just have values, OK? Um, which I think is the way tuples should be. They should sort of be ephemeral. They shouldn't have this kind of life of their own. And also, it's more efficient. So, that, so that's good. Um, you could actually, actually, um, tuples are not only value types, they're also mutable. And I know there are people in the functional camp that are going to revolt about this because they already have. Um, but uh, tuples are mutable. You can mutate a tuple. So instead of doing this, I could actually write it. It's probably less uh, elegant, but I could write r.s plus equals the value, and as a separate statement, r.c plus plus. No pun intended. Well, a little. But um, so I can actually mutate the tuple in place. Because that's not dangerous, because there's no shared mutable state among threads or whatever here, because it's a struct, right? Nobody's sharing it. You pass it to someone, it's a copy. So it's not actually dangerous. Um, so we just said, what the heck? Why, this is one of these, like, why does it always have to be so object-oriented, right? right? Why does everything have to be encapsulated? And, and so there's no, so tuples don't have these, they, they don't have properties. They just have fields. They're just a struct with some mutable public fields there, all right? It's as simple as it gets so you understand what you have. Um, I think that's right for tuples because they're not really an abstraction. They're not wrapping something. They're just values. So let them just be values. So um, let, that I could do this, but let's actually not because I like the other thing better. Okay. Um, so uh, the remaining few things there are to say about tuples is that um, since it's a type, um, it's a type. It, ha it has value equality, so you can use it as a key in um, in a dictionary, for instance. That means you, if you want to kind of uh, if you want you to be keyed off of two things. Uh, that both have to be right, then you can just use the tuple as the key, and everything works right. The hash code and everything works out right in the, in the data structures. Um, also, of course, it's a good way to get multiple results back from an asynchronous method, because if you're async um, and, you, uh, and you return task of a tuple, then it all works out. When you go up here and await it, uh, the tuple comes back out, and you can deconstruct it and keep going. Right? So they're, they're a good transport for... Um, uh, the situation around uh, multiple results was even worse for async methods and other methods because you couldn't use out parameters, but now you can just use tuples. Okay? Um, of course, I don't get to await because that thing was not async, but ignore that. Okay? So that's tuples for you. Um, the other thing that I, I think is, um, is quite interesting is, the, um, is that we are, we are starting to add pattern matching to C Sharp. And um, that's a whole new concept that we're, again, bringing in from the functional camp. And we're sort of doing it gradually. So I think that you'll see more on that front uh, in, in um, later versions of C Sharp. But uh, we're taking a big step, I think, uh, in introducing the first couple of patterns. Um, and so how does this work? Well, let's, let's uh, turn this example into one where we have recursive lists of numbers. So instead of an int array, this is an object array where we just have a convention that the things inside are either ints or there are other arrays with ints in them. So a new object array with some of these ints nested inside, um, like this. Maybe there's also a null in there for good measure. Um, and now we want to update the tally method so that it can deal with that. So let's take object arrays instead here. And now uh, we get an error here because, um, because v is not an int anymore. It's an object. So we need to know that it's an int before we can add it here. So we need some kind of logic there. And, um, and uh, what we would do in the old days is we'd do a type test. So we'll say if, um, if v is int, then we can go and do this. But um, of course, just even though we just checked that it's int, we don't actually know it again down here. We have to check it again and cast it or whatever. So what we're doing instead now is we're, we're as a first approximation, you can think of it as we're extending the is expression so that you can now declare a variable here. When you say it's int, when you ask if it's int, if it is, then take that int and put it into the new variable i. 
And then the variable i has the value of v, but typed as in. So now I can add it here, um, and I know I'm good. Okay? So it's sort of a, just a, an extended version of the is expression, if you will. But what's really going on is that the is expression is now being extended to allow patterns, which is a new concept in C sharp, patterns instead of just types. And patterns can be many different things. They can't be very many different things now. They can essentially just be constants or type, uh, type patterns like this. It could be uh, like a constant could, for instance, be, you could, you could say v is 7. <laughs> that's actually also now allowed because that's a constant pattern. Um, and, um, and then we are taking these patterns and we're integrating them into language features such as the is expression. The other place where we're integrating it, just to, um, um, just to stay with the example here, is we're integrating into the switch statement. So if I say, um, if I say switch, if I could spell here, switch, I can now switch on anything. It used to be that switch could just switch on primitive types. It's sort of this dinosaur of a feature. But now I can switch on anything. I can switch on object. Um, switch on V, uh, and now in my switch statement, I can have cases that have not just constants in them, which are now just a special kind of pattern, but the cases can have any kind of pattern. So I can say case int i, except we need to do some, um, something to intelligence here to completion before we uh, ship this. Um, and, I, and I have to remember the break, that's why I'm getting the, uh, the squiggly there. And now, I've essentially used a pattern, so, so I, I extended the, the, the case clauses in a switch statement to be able to apply a pattern and say when this pattern applies, do this particular case, right? And so now I can, so now I've sort of modernized the switch statement a bit. I can also say case um, uh, object array, which is the other thing I'm expecting. Um, let's call that A. And I can actually also put conditions in my switch, in my case clauses here. So I can say I only want the object A when uh, when a is, is uh, longer than zero, because a dot, uh, a dot length is greater than zero, because otherwise there's no work to do, right? And then when that's the case, I can do var uh, t equals tally the, the nested array, um, and um, and go add that to to r as well. R equals r dot, you know how it goes. R dot s plus t dot sum comma r dot c plus uh, t dot count, right? And a break. So um, again, spelling helps. Uh, so so there's, uh, there's a generalization of existing features with patterns, and that's how far we got in C sharp so far uh, with pattern matching. There are some things that, um, if I go back to the slides here, um, some things that we would like to do, there are more things we want to do with patterns um, in the future. First of all, uh, we want to have smarter patterns, so it sh you should be able to have recursive patterns. Um, we actually, I didn't show, but we actually also let, it, uh, let you specify in a given type that it can be deconstructed. So you can specify in a point type, for instance, that it can be deconstructed, just like I deconstructed the tuple into se separate variables. And when things are deconstructible, why don't we why don't we put that together with the pattern matching and allow you to uh, f both check that O is a point, and if it is, deconstruct it and get, you know, maybe apply patterns recursively here saying, if O is a point and the first part of that point, the X is five, then put the second part into variable Y and do something with Y, right? So you can kind of get smarter and smarter patterns. It can pr you can probably also write unreadable code with this, but I think in, in general it's, um, it's going to be useful to be able to dig a little deeper in a pattern. The other thing is, maybe we should, uh, we should come up with new places to have uh, patterns. The, the switch statement is kind of, it is kind of 60s, right? And, um, and so maybe there's a, an expression version of the switch statement. Maybe it's a match expression, like it's called in functional languages, that's an, that, uh, where the, that has a niftier syntax, it's expression-based, the, the cases are expressions, um, and your code gets a little more terse like that. But that's the kind of thing that we can, now we have the, the notion of patterns in there, we can both add new patterns and add new places where they occur. So that's one thing that we are focused on for the next version of C Sharp, which we're already working on because C Sharp 7 is pretty much done. We just haven't shipped it yet, and don't ask me when. Um, the other thing we're thinking about is that one of the things I talked about kind of moving with the state of the art, and one of the things that's becoming mainstream in newer uh, lovely little languages is that, um, uh, is the ability to distinguish in the type system between 
when things are supposed to be nullable and when they're not. Right? This variable is supposed to sometimes be null. It's part of its domain. This one isn't. So why am I getting null reference exceptions all the time? The previous guy here, um, Heidi, talked about the same thing for, um, for, for Kotlin. And uh, Swift has that as well and so on. So we've been like, can we do something for C Sharp along these lines, even though we've had seven versions now where uh, nullability has been purely a runtime thing? And we think we can. And it's, uh, it's along familiar lines, maybe, um, where um, we already have that trailing question mark in C Sharp for nullable value types. So if we allow you to apply that to a reference type, maybe that's how you say that something is nullable. And if you say that, then there are things we won't let you do. On the other hand, if you don't say that, and you opt into this new world somehow, then we will expect the thing in there to not be null, and we will help you maintain that. OK? So what that means is I can assign null into the n, but not into the s. And I can't assign n to s without any qualification either, because that, would, that might be a null. Right? So I'm just protecting the variable from the kinds of variables that, it, that it's not supposed to hold. On the other hand, though, when I want to use it to reference it, um, uh, I can do s.length without um, any qualification, because I know it's not null. I, I know it's probably not null, because we probably can't give uh, any absolute guarantees in a language like C Sharp. But it's probably going to find most of the places where, where you're not supposed to dot. Right? And so on the other hand, n.length is going to warn you about it, it um, potentially being null, and you're potentially getting that uh, null reference exception. Right? And so the way to get around that is some of these new languages, they have specific new null checking features. All right? They have like a new way that pattern matching or whatever you can use to check for null. We don't want to change how you check for null. There are already like seven ways of checking for null in C Sharp. We're good, thanks. So what we want to do instead is to track, with a, for, have the compiler track when you check that something was null, and then use that knowledge. So if you have an if statement that checks that and sees that n is not in fact null in this case, uh, then we will know that in the scope of that check, n is in fact not null. And we'll assume that it's fine that you dot into it. Okay. Are there ways to get around this? Yeah. But you kind of have to work a little to get around it now. Uh, it, instead of the other way around, where you have to work all the time to eliminate all your null reference exceptions. So um, there'll also be a, a damn it operator, we call it, <laughs> where you can actually walk up to a nullable thing and put a bang, post fix bang on it. And that means the thing, the thing you are, but assuming in the type system that that was not null, because I know better uh, than the compiler. So sometimes you, you just know that for some, you tested something else, an enum somewhere, and you know in this case this is never null. And if you're bold enough to, to stick with that, you, you get to insist, and we will let you dot without a warning. All right? So that's another thing that we're, we're already working on this feature, and, and we're hoping to get it into the next version of C Sharp. So hopefully that's going to be useful. The, the, the interesting thing about a feature like this is it, it needs to not only go into the language, but we need to make sure that our frameworks and so on are uh, adequately annotated so that when you build on those, you get the right nullabilities uh, uh, propagated into your own code. Okay, so it's a bit of a challenging feature, but I think it's worth it. So I think we are at the end where I say, remember to fill out evaluations. Do know that we are over time. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. <laughs>